What's going on all you mentees? This is the Uncanny Omar from Near Mint Condition and join me today for your weekly dosage of advanced looks at some collected editions coming out from Marvel this week. So let's get started. And welcome back everybody. Before getting started, a huge thank you to David Gabriel and the folks at Marvel for sending us advanced copies of these collected editions. All these books are due out on July 21st in the direct market and then a few weeks later in the book market so we got some awesome books this week i it was really difficult to uh put some down to go read another one because i didn't want to stop reading punisher brings back a lot of childhood memories uh doctor strange is the reprint of the doctor strange volume one i'll be doing a comparison here in a little bit when i get to it generation x i mean that's 90s nostalgia for a lot of us and of course these two new books that take place during the king and black event so let's get started again i'll be putting timestamps in the description of the video so you can just hop around if you want i don't talk about spoilers but just in case sometimes i do give people a fair warning ahead of time that if i am going to talk about spoilers but if there's a particular book you don't want to know anything about you just want to jump in blind by all means please skip it all right let's get started with namor Got the King in Black Namor miniseries. Now, I was completely mistaken because I thought that the Agents of Atlas King in Black miniseries led into this. I was wrong. This is its own thing. I mean, sure, they both lead into the King in Black, but this is more of a past event. It's kind of like the symbiote Spider-Man story that Peter David wrote for the King in Black tie-in. So this is Kurt Busiek, one of my favorite writers of all time, writing the character of Namor. Now, we go back when from present time to long ago, as he states. So there's this huge battle that's about to take place in the past. There's the inner turmoil happening in Atlantis. So it's a young Namor with a couple of other surprises, of course, one of them being Dorma. And if you know much about the character of the Submariner, Dorma has played a big role in his life, well, ever since his first appearance in the Golden Age. And this is Kurt Busiek getting to write a young Namor and a young Dorma. And some nice surprises too. There's a lot of new characters, but there's some really nice Easter eggs uh, that show up here. Uh, that's what I think I enjoyed the most about this. And honestly, reading this, kind of like reading The Invaders a little bit, Makes me wish this was an ongoing series because, I mean, it's Kurt Busiek. He's familiar with all these characters and he helps just catch people up to speed with who these characters are. So, yes, we keep going back and forth. We go from present day to the past, but it mainly focuses on the past. Now, how Noel plays a role in Namor's past, well, that's, uh, that's for you to find out. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there. Kind of in the same way that Symbiote Spider-Man was there. And the artwork is all drawn by Benjamin Dewey. So I'm just showcasing what the artwork looks like. And this does lead into the King in Black event. Now, as I've mentioned before, along with the other book I'm going to be talking about here in a few minutes, that if a King in Black omnibus were to come out sometime, hypothetically speaking, because I don't know for sure if it will or not, I'm not sure if series like this will be collected in there. It would be cool to have it all in one, but my goodness, there's so many tie-ins and so many mini-series. I feel like there's enough material for two Omnis, but that's just my opinion. Uh, now, what we do have towards the end of each issue are variant covers on the opposite page of the standard edition covers. Uh, and the standard edition covers, by the way, are all supplied by Lionel Francis Yu. As a matter of fact, this is, I think, issue number five cover. And as far as extras, censoring that final page, of course, because there are absolutely no other extras in the back. Just this variant here. And then the King in Black logo. So the book has 112 pages and retails for $15.99. And as I mentioned, collects all five issues of the Namor King in Black miniseries. This one was fun. The Union. So here we have a new team based out of England. So this is a book that I think I find really interesting because I think I announced this book during solicitations. This was originally supposed to come out sometime in 2019, but because of COVID and all that, everything got delayed. This is written here by Paul Grist. It's drawn by Andrea De Vito with Paul Grist. 
And then you also have the inks of Paul Grist in here. So it seems like Paul Grist did a lot along with others. Now, here's the issue with this. Since this was, I think, supposed to be originally uh, released in 2019, it feels like they kind of shoehorned the whole King and Blackman. Even though it does not say anywhere on the front that this is a King and Black tie-in on the spine, I think maybe a little bit in the back they mentioned the king in black and then of course the very beginning here this recap page right there talking about null because this feels like two different stories happening at once you have the introduction of some of these new characters some of them have been around for a while uh, but you have this new team so you have this team of snakes you have union jack you have the choir uh, you also have kelpie and then their leader britannia so they're all out of different places in England. And much like the case of Excalibur, you know what? I'm sure everybody is going to compare this to Excalibur. But this feels more like Justice League International to me than Excalibur. There's a lot of great moments in here. But I think like some of it had to be rewritten so they can include this King and in Black tie-in. So sometimes you're taking, or at least I was, like, and I know it's not a review of the book, but I do need to warn people ahead of time. There's Kelpie, I really like her. Uh, uh, warn people ahead of time that it does feel like two different stories. Like one was written a long time ago and the other one had to be written for the King and Black tie-in. Which sometimes that works though. So I don't know, you may actually enjoy this because it is a King and Black tie-in. So one of the things I was gonna say is of course everybody's gonna uh, compare it to Excalibur, but it's really difficult not to when you have uh, even the art kind of harnessing that Alan Davis or, or Paul Neary look to their art style. Now, I'm not familiar with Paul Grist at all. I'm not sure what else he's written, but this was a lot of fun and I would like to see what other things he's written. And I'm kind of curious if he's written any Judge Dredd. So this collects the five issue miniseries that came out in 2020. The, the book retails for $15.99 and has 112 pages. And once again, no idea if this is going to be collected in a King and Black omnibus. Mainly because, well, there is no King and Black logo in the front. It's just the Union the Britannia project. That's all I see. Now, there are other characters that show up here, and there are some shocking moments that surprised me. Um, I didn't see coming. And I like that about comics. No matter how long I've been reading comics, I still like being shocked and surprised. So... Um, yeah, this one was a lot of fun. Let's look in the back here for some extras. So we do have some variant covers. Then we also have some character designs back here. Um, so I think this is another series that I would love to see continue, just like Namor. Mainly because I didn't get to know some of these characters that much, like Snakes, or Kelpie for that matter. Alright, let's keep going. Doctor Strange, Epic Collection, Volume 1 master of the mystic arts so this is a new printing the book was previously released a few years ago however it's from the infamous printer the quad pro printers so you can probably tell from my printing right here of the quad pro that the cover doesn't do its job of covering the entire front part of the book the spine of course is misaligned and here let's compare it to the spine of this book of the new printing uh, even the purple is a little more purple a little more brighter with the new printing maybe that's how you can tell the difference if you're ever out shopping but really what you need to look for is this misaligned spine and then the back of the book um, in the new printing the ISBN number is all the way down here and over here is all the way to the right and it's vertical not horizontal and one of the biggest problems with a lot of people uh, with Quad Pro books is that the covers are so thin that they started curling on people. Mine has been in between two books, and they were really tight against this book to kind of keep the cover down. Uh, but yes, the same thing happened to Venom and uh, one, one of the Daredevil epics. So as far as the paper quality comparison, though, again, the new printing on the right, honestly, they feel about the same. Maybe the new printing is just a little bit thicker than the Quad Pro printing, but they feel about the same. Not much difference, but that wasn't the biggest issue with the Quad Pro book. It was mainly the quality control on the cover itself. 
whereas this feels thicker. All right, so let's talk about this book really quick. So this one is printed at the LSC printer in America. A new printing of a classic. This is a volume one. This is where he began his journey with the Marvel Universe, and that is in Strange Tales number 110. And here he is looking all like Vincent Price. So Doctor Strange, Stephen Strange, and his origin story. Now, of course, you don't get to see his origin until a little bit later. So this does collect Strange Tales 110 to 111, 114 to 146, and, of course, the Spider-Man Annual number 2. Now, you're probably thinking... That's a lot of books. That's a crap ton of books. Not really, because as you could probably tell uh, from here, the strange tales were about four pages each. Up until the character got popular, and then he started getting six pages and then eight pages. So Stanley and Steve Ditko. Look, um, this okay. So this does skip the issues that he's not included in, like one twelve and one thirteen. So he shared a magazine with the Human Torch and the Thing. And even towards like 116, 115, he didn't even get the credit like, look for Doctor Strange adventures in this comic. No, nothing like that. No respect for Doctor Stephen Strange. It wasn't until I think 117 maybe that you might see a little blurb of like, hey, you'll find Doctor Strange in this comic book. Here's Nightmare. There's a lot of introductions here to characters like, of course, Dormammu, Baron Mordo. There we go. What issues? 117. Uh, Doctor Strange in the Terrible Traps of Baron Mordo. So now he starts getting a little recognition because people started following his adventures. So much so that by issue 118, and see what I mean, now it's expanded to eight pages, we get Doctor Strange on a cover for the first time in Strange Tales number 118. However, he's still, you know, small compared to The Thing and The Human Torch. Because this was basically their book and he was just kind of appearing as a guest star as a backup story rather and there's nothing wrong with that because oh man uh okay and then even later i think when nick fury shows up he's still like second string to nick fury and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get there but these are some classic stories and this is when steve ditko was just trying out different things with his artwork it's absolutely gorgeous some of the trippy things that he draws yes eventually dr strange does get to meet uh the rest of the marvel universe through these adventures but at first it's just really him you know guarding the realm the mystic realm of earth uh we we're introduced to a lot of his supporting cast throughout these pages here's the fabulous pinup page that they're using for a variant cover of the omnibus reprint when it comes out early next year or is it late this year i can't keep up i gotta watch those breaking news again um so i have gone back to rename the breaking news though I, I, after a week after the video has been out i do like to go back and rename them um so people can find the videos easier where the hell was I? Oh yes, they're using that as a reprint and spe or cover. And speaking of the omnibus, the omnibus does collect the exact same material that you're gonna find here. Uh, 400 pages, I think there's letter pages too, is what they're putting in there. Um, I'm not sure I sold mine a long time ago. Uh, I, I went the epic route, man, I'm, I was an epic guy. All right, uh, this is also the same material that's in the big Ditko is strange big monster sized book with the exception of the spider-man annual and we'll get there so this is all before dr strange got his own series but after this he ended up getting his own series and then uh, roy thomas built the defenders out of that and then he got another series but that's a whole different story this book as i mentioned has 400 pages and retails for 39 dollars 99 and holy crap when he meets eternity this is when he gets wild look at that that is amazing no pun intended, even though Steve Ditko did co-create The Amazing Spider-Man. But just the different type of things that Ditko was doing. Man. <clears throat> that is some Dali-esque type of art. I love it. Um, let's look in the back here for some extra. So here's the ending of the Spider-Man annual adventure here. And then we have some penciled art that's unused from Steve Ditko. Crazy that people have that somewhere. The classics, Doctor Strange house ad, reprints, like the Doctor Strange classics here. Some of them drawn by John Byrne. 
and Marble Masterworks when they were doing these kind of painted covers. So it's somebody painted over Steve Ditko's art. And then the Alex Ross cover that they used for the Omnibus, the standard edition part of the Omnibus. For those of you interested, here are what all the spines look like together for this week. All right, let's keep going. A book I'm so excited to talk about because the Punisher is one of my favorite Marvel characters I often don't talk about because, well, there's just not that many collected editions of his classic stuff. I know there's a bunch of his modern stuff and there's a couple of Omnis from um, Garth Ennis and of course Jason Aaron. Rick Remender got an Omnibus. But his classic stuff, it seems like we get one or two epic collections a year. And it feels like it's been a year since the last one. So here we have Return to Big Nothing, which as a kid, I absolutely sought after. I could not find it anywhere. And because it had mature content, um, you know, I couldn't buy it at my comic store. Dr. Comics, though, at the flea market sold it to me. So this is volume four of the ongoing Epic Collections, collecting the years 1989 to 1990. As a matter of fact, this one came out in 1989. And you can probably tell why I was after it. And that is because of the phenomenal artwork here by Mike Zek love his artwork i've talked about him on the channel before and i've also said i love to see his death lock collected in a um in an oversized hardcover format so this one is an interesting story where the punisher meets back up with one of his fellow soldiers that he fought with alongside in the vietnam war however this has to do with human trafficking and drug trafficking and of course betrayal there is a really cool line. It's edgy. I don't care. It's awesome. Keep in mind, this is the stuff that was coming out long before we had Garth Ennis's Max series, which of course you can't you can't outdo. No matter because I mean we were censored back then in the 80s. And then we get his own ongoing series, of course. So this does collect the classic uh, Punisher graphic novel, Return to Big Nothing, issues 26 through 34 of the Punisher, uh, annual number three. Classic Punisher number one, which uh, is black and white. And then we have the Marvel graphic novel Intruder and Kingdom Gone in here. So there's a lot of awesome stuff that happens here. Uh, you have the work of Mike Barron. You have the work of Stephen Grant. You have the work of Chuck Dixon in here. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get there. So here's Intruder, Mike Barron's uh, work. This one here, the thing that stands out to me, this is the one with mature content uh, as well, because it was a graphic novel. And, and by mature content, I don't mean the things that they've gotten away with in the Max line. I just mean it's a little more violent. It's a little th things that crossing the line that you normally wouldn't in a monthly comic book. Uh, this is a story about a family that gets accidentally gunned down, leaving a young daughter behind. And of course, the Punisher leaves her uh I think he, oh yeah, he leaves her with the priest when he was thinking about becoming a priest. He gets with Microchip, his sidekick at the time. And yes, technology is outdated. I don't care. Chip was still able to work some magic. And to try to find who these bad guys are. Of course, uh, he gets into some trouble. But the main thing, that, that's an understatement. Okay, but the main thing about this is the way that there's a scene here. That's crazy. And as a kid, I was like, oh my God, this is the most horrible thing that can happen to a human being. So it's this torture scene right here. All right. So in this particular torture scene, he is not only being bagged right there, but they also filled a bag full of urine. And as a kid, I thought, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Why would people do this? Anyway, that's part of the reason why I love The Punisher. When we get back to the ongoing series, we do have the Axe of Vengeance, and he gets to take on somebody he hasn't fought before, and that is, of course, Doctor Doom. It's a classic Axe of Vengeance storyline. And then we get... Um, oh, he fights the Reavers in here as well. And I remember that when I was collecting every appearance of every X-Men character, every bad guy... The Reavers were here, and this is where Pretty Boy ends up getting the Punisher logo. So later on, when he appears in the pages of Uncanny X-Men 269, where he tries to help Rogue out, he's wearing the Punisher logo on his shirt. That's pretty much where it comes from. Uh, but the other story I want to talk about, oh, the, here's annual number three. This is part of the Life Form storyline, which continues into Daredevil and then Hulk 
and then Silver Surfer, but this is just part one. And I think there's a recap. Let's make sure. Nope, no recap. It just tells you it continues into Daredevil Annual Number 5. Here's some wonderful artwork by uh, Mark Texieria. And I think Dwayne Turner is the finisher on this. Uh, I don't think it's just uh, Tex. Let's see. Artist. Nope, it's just Tex. I was wrong. All right. But the other story I wanted to talk about is this one here. Kingdom Gone. Now, the main thing I wanted to talk about is the artist Jorge Safino. Now, I love Chuck Dixon's writing. I think it's great. It, it's a pretty basic plot line here. It's, uh, he's traveling in South America. It's a little island to take out this drug lord. That's pretty much it. But the artwork here by Safino, I loved. As a kid, I hated his art because he drew, oh, what was it? Uh, Terror Incorporated. He drew that series. But then later on, like in my 20s, I found a bunch of, uh, no, I was giving my buddy Shaka gave me a bunch of Punisher comics including Winter World, which is something that Safino drew. And I thought it was a different artist, and it's this kind of art style. And I loved it. Uh, I don't know if it, in terror, like he was changing his art style, or if it was just rushed. It just felt different. But his art style here, it's so gritty. Oh, man. This is my kind of art during, like, I... Oh, but I really enjoy his art here. The panels are easy to follow. Uh, his layouts are great. The action sequences are awesome. Not a review of the book. What am I doing? I'm just pinpointing that I really like this guy's artwork. There's a little bit... I know it's it's hard to see, probably. But uh, the first time I saw... Uh, not Jimmy Chung. Uh, Oliver uh, Copiel. His artwork kind of reminded me a little bit of this. Just a little bit. I'm not sure if you can even see it or not. Um, all right, let's look at the extras. Sorry, opening up old comics just brings back a lot of memories. Chuck Dixon, this is, I love when they used to do this. Uh, each of the graphic novels, the artist would do the bio like this, drawing the, uh, the creators. Return a big nothing. Intruder. That's the trade paperback, Essential Punisher. See, this is the kind of stuff I want in omnibus format. You know, we've got the Going to War classic, but this is the kind of stuff that I want. I want this stuff collected in omnibus format one day. Oh, one more thing I forgot to note. Here's the classic. Uh, is that, see, this is how they would draw the bios. Uh, the book has 480 pages, and this one is $44.99. So it's a little more than your usual Epic Collections, which is $39.99. But I think next year, I think that's the price point uh, they're going up to, $44.99. All right, I've talked about new books, I've talked about a reprint, and I've talked about 80s nostalgia. But how about this? 90s nostalgia, Generation X Epic Collection, Volume, I couldn't even, Uncanny Omar, talk pretty one day. Volume 1. This is crazy. Look, 1994 to 1995 is now considered epic. That's crazy. Here's what the spine looks like. Mine's a little bit misaligned there. Hope not all of them are like that. I was just talking about the misalignment of the Doctor Strange epic. Uh, but the book, I mean, this is a lot better than the Quad Pro as far as the cover. All right. So here we have Generation X. This is crazy. Uh, to have it as an epic collection, you know, because this stuff has been previously released as Generation X classics. Uh, there was a coming of Generation, or the this one right here. The Origin of Generation X, this trade paperback right here, which is mainly a Phalanx Covenant trade paperback. And I'm so used to seeing this in Chromium cover. Oh, that would have been nice. Wishful thinking. We have some beautiful Joe Mad artwork. So this does have Uncanny X-Men 316 to 318. So it even has the aftermath of Phalanx Covenant. Adjectiveless X-Men 36 and 37. Generation X 1 through 9. So uh, a lot more than the first volume of the classics. It's like volume 1 and 2 of the classics. But it also contains Wolverine 94. The Collector's Preview. And then the Ash Can number 1. Book retails for $39.99 and has 480 pages. So it's a big book. It's a big book. Uh, here's the timeline. This is one of my favorite things that uh, they used to do. They put it in the back of the book, but I, no, this was a fold out. That's right, this was a fold out timeline. 
Very cool. Glad that it's all included in here. So yes, we are introduced to some new kids in uh, the Phalanx Covenant. Pretty much when the Phalanx pretended to be X-Men, only a group of young kids are left alive. Um, or not assimilated, rather. Where And then we also have Sabretooth, White Queen, and it's really where White Queen kind of becomes the good guy. And uh, Banshee, as well as Jubilee. So we're introduced to a group of new generation, and the next generation of X-Men. So we have, um, well... That's a little bit of a spoiler there because not all those kids make it out. Including one with some very cool powers. But the ones that do make it out get to form this team called Generation X. So we have M, we have Jubilee. We're introduced to Jonathan here, Jono, um, Chamber, uh, Skin, Sink. Did I say M already? L Husk. And then at the very end of issue number one... Gateway shows up, and he, for the first time, speaks and says, Penance. Talking about this young lady here. So that's mainly your team. Oh, I love that they have this ash can stuff. Oh, no, this is from issue number one. So, yes, in the aftermath of Phalanx Covenant, we're introduced to this new generation of X-Men. And, man, this was so fun. This was so good. This Chris Bacalo, Scott Lobdell, Mark Buckingham, just... It was so awesome to be an X-Men reader back then. Just because, you know, we've seen this before with New Mutants, but I wasn't there from the beginning of New Mutants. I didn't get to experience that. I got to experience Excalibur when it spun off. I got to uh, experience X-Force. But this was different. This was a young version of X-Men. And it had Jubilee. Love or hate her. Doesn't matter, man. She was wonderful. She was the heart of the X-Men for such a long time. But that'll change, of course, later on when Wolverine left and whatever. And uh, But yes, one of my favorite things that they did do here was include issue number 318 right here. Drawn by Roger Cruz before he took uh, a Joe Mad style. He was doing a Jim Lee style here. But it is included in here, issue 318. And going back to Gen X, looking at this wonderful, beautiful Chris Bacalo. And you can't forget Mark Buckingham had a lot to do with it, too, his inks. Now, one thing I do want you to know, hey, there's Mondo, who shows up way later, who was supposed to be in the first arc, but for some reason got written out. Um, one thing I do want you to take notice is, this is pretty interesting. Ah, oh, the return of the orphan maker and nanny. Is that Bacalo's style, or I don't know if it was a decision by him or Buckingham, changes. So this is the way that uh, skin looked. Before the Age of Apocalypse. So this is the final issue right here. Issue number four. And then you get Generation Next. Which takes all place during the Age of Apocalypse. Uh, the characters that they uh, that he was drawing. I don't know if it was easier or what. This is the Orphan Maker's new outfit. And Orphan Maker and Nanny are now popular. Because of the Hellions. They are people I found. I've always enjoyed them. I thought they were uh, weird and crazy. Yes. But during the return. After the Age of Apocalypse. He changes the way that skin looks, and he changes the way that he drew Jubilee. Uh, and honestly, the kids look, I don't know, they just look a lot more anime-ish, which I liked. There's, diff there's a big difference between the way he drew Jubilee in the first issue, right here, and the cute Jubilee that he draws after the Age of Apocalypse. Same thing can be said about Husk. She looks a lot more mature in that first issue. Now, it could be that he was just getting used to these characters, or he had so much fun in the way that he drew them during the Age of Apocalypse Generation Next that he changed up his art style, but skin particularly looking a lot different than those early appearances. And this is the skin that I really like. But yes, uh, the first nine issues are here. And it's interesting to see that progression in art and also the story, too. Like, what kind of fun they have yes there's a lot of throwbacks to a lot of these old x-men stories but then there's some new things like we're we're introduced to empath or emplate sorry empath it's a new mutants character emplate who's their big villain in the first issue uh this is when roger cruz takes over for a few issues for the cassidy in storyline this is the wolverine issue and back to roger cruz oh that's right he's the villain artist for this and then what happened? Oh, that's right. Mark Buckingham and Chris Bacalo um, left Generation X for a, for some months because they were doing the death 
the Time of Your Life miniseries, which was a follow-up to the Cost of Living. So that's what they were doing. But they are, um, let me see, it's Roger Cruz at first for, uh, for the Cassidy storyline, the Cassidy Inn, Cassidy Keep, that's what it's called, and then Tom Grumet, who I always wanted to see take over the book because he was really good at drawing young characters like Robin um, and, of course, the Teen Titans. He did some fill-in for Young Justice. This is all the Ashcan and the special number one. All the, there's, a, there's a huge chunk of extras back here is all I can say. This book has 480 pages, retailing for $39.99. I always loved that house ad of Phalanx coming. The guy was a big Joe Mad fan. Salvador La Roca, Derek Robertson. These are the standard um, edition issues. These are the ones that you would find at the pharmacies, or you had a choice uh, between the $2.95 version or, or the $1.95 version of Phalanx Covenant. Hey, the trade paperback we just looked at. So that's even included in here. The artwork, even though the kids don't look anything like that during this run. The trading cards. And, of course, covers to the Generation X collections in the past. Sorry I go on way too long about these books. But this is my life in comics. That, as they say, is that. If you're interested in purchasing any of these books, don't forget to check out our sponsor, this episode is sponsored by CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for brand new graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They pride themselves on packaging your books so they arrive safely and in an excellent condition as well as prompt and helpful service. Check out the bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. CGN is excited to announce that they are now taking pre-orders. They're making it easier for you to ensure that you don't miss out on the hottest releases. CGN is currently running a special promotion for you minties. If you're a first-time customer, let them know that you were referred by near mint condition at the checkout and you'll receive a credit for free shipping on your next order. Order. This promotion is valid for U.S. customers only. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount and quality shipping and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was the content, the page count, and and that was the content and the page count of each of these collected editions. Let me know in the comments down below if you're getting every Epic Collection, if you're upgrading your Doctor Strange Epic Collection, or if you're okay with the Quad Pro version. If you're excited about the Punisher, again, I love this character, and I wish we had more of these Epic Collections. Or Generation X, the very first Epic I can't believe we're in the 90s looking at Epic Collections. That's crazy. And if you read either Namor or The Union. Again, this was The Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. We are on Spreadshop and on Patreon. Amazing ways to support the channel. And thank you so much to our existing patrons. Couldn't make videos like this without you all. And more importantly, everyone, please stay healthy, stay safe, and much love. <laughs>